Their mantra is grow fast or die trying and they are really growing faster than perhaps even they imagined, commanding a 95% market share of India's warehouse automation space. Well, it's my great privilege to have on the program Samai Kohli and Akash Gupta, the founders of Grey Orange. And we're going to sort of uh, spend the next half an hour trying to figure out what they do, but all of us, all of us, I'm sure, are connected to what they have developed in one way or the other. Uh, tell me one thing before we get into details. You're both wearing shades of grey and orange. Mm -hmm. Grey, as I discovered, uh, you know, for grey matter experience and intellect and reliability and orange for fun, creativity and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Is that also your model? Is that how it also works uh, uh, for you, Akash, and then Samar? Right, absolutely. I think uh, it has to be a combination of, uh, you know, grey matter as well as creativity and fun while you are doing uh, at least a startup because, uh, you know, it's going to be a long journey and you need that kind of thing to kind of take it forward. Right. So, the, I mean, I love what I do and I have fun doing it and mm -hmm. therefore I do it even though it, it is challenging. Samar, does that sort of sum it up? Absolutely. This has to be a place where we love working, right? Mm. So we have to have fun at doing it. Mm. And then if you don't learn from your experiences, then there's no use of doing it. Right. So that's why it's grey and orange. Right. So grey and orange and what they do. Well, like I said, India's warehouse automation market is largely in their hands. And I, I wanted to sort of try and help our viewers and me, of course, try and understand a bit of uh, what you do. So what all those who are ordering things online, and, and if I may add here that some of our biggest uh, e-com players like Flipkart, there's Snapdeal, Jabong, Mitra, and, and I, I would imagine a lot more are using your products. Your products in their warehouses, helping them get the products that their customers have ordered to the customer in record time, because now it's all about speed and also getting it right. Let, let's not sure. compromise that. Give us a sense of your two main products, Sorter and Butler. What okay. they do, you can choose any one <coughs> and I'll take it to our yeah. Sorter. Uh, right, so Sorter is basically a conveyor-based uh, machine. Mm -hmm. So let's say whenever everyone orders uh, things online, mm -hmm. uh, a warehouse basically kind of uh, picks the items which we have ordered. Right. right. So once, let's say, all the items have been picked and you have like, let's say, 40,000 items, they very quickly need to be sorted out what is the location of these items to be shipped through flights. So what sortation system does is it sorts them into different cities or different pin codes. Right. right? So you keep on putting the packets on this machine and right. this machine automatically sorts uh, around 120 packets per minute for the warehouse to ship them very quickly to different destinations. Right, so there's of course speed that is mm -hmm. involved because it's 120 packets a minute and mm -hmm. there's, there's there's no need for any human intervention right. at right. this stage. That, that's right. Does yeah. that cut down error also? And of course That, that of cut down error hugely because you know sorting uh, packets at that speed it will be pretty right. much impossible for human being to do it accurately, right. right? And a machine while reading a barcode can do it very accurately. So right. that cut downs a lot of errors. Before I get into Butler uh, somewhere, you were the first guys who thought of it and you sort of sort of moved ahead at a time you're a college startup let me first quickly tell our viewers college startup on the campus of bits pilani is is where the idea first came through right. at that time startups weren't as cool as they are flipkart okay. and snapdeal weren't really the buzzwords then how did you think of being in this space then sort of like how do you stay five steps ahead of the game how did the idea even strike you it was a gamble wasn't it uh, I think it's always a gamble. Uh -huh. So, um, uh -huh. but I think the uh, the thing that really catches us is seeing a problem which is really worth solving. Mm. And uh, one of our seniors had invited us to one of these warehouses, mm. and when we saw the amount of you know piles and piles of goods lying and people just trying to maneuver them and trying to do anything in it, mm. something clicked. which just mm. said that we don't know whether this is a huge business idea or not, mm. but this definitely is a big enough problem mm. which I think we could solve. Mm. And that's essentially how we got onto the problem of trying mm. to solve it. Mm. So is it fair to say that, uh, uh, you know, there's of course a risk. We're not sure if this is a good business idea, but we want to try it. And then we see how it goes. Is, yeah. is, is that the approach that you had? It's pretty much as long as you keep pivoting. You don't have yeah. to be stuck to idea, I think, but that is fundamentally our approach, which is try solving a big enough problem. And what was the support like at home, if I may ask? Because we are traditionally a society where people want you to sort of go down the tried and tested a little, like taking such a big risk, coming out from, say, a top campus, and yeah. not taking, say, more lucrative, or uh, on the face of it, immediate lucrative offers. <coughs> okay. So what is it like? Was that convincing at home? 
Uh, I think we'll answer individually. Yes. But uh, for me, I think uh, my parents were okay with starting up, but uh -huh. not right after college. Right. So they thought that, you know, you'll do three, four years of at least work X and then right. try to get right. into this. Right. So there was some amount of convincing at that level. Right. And the only thing that really I was trying to tell them was that in, in our entire college life, we were at the top of the game of robotics. So right. we thought okay. that if we take a two, three year break per se, by going and, and doing something else, we we'll lose that advantage or that right. uh, edge that we had. Right. At least um, for me, we were starting when I was in third year, so yeah. you know it was it was more of uh, why don't I go and try it out? Right. Uh, of course, like in my family, pretty much nobody is from the business background. Everybody is from the service background, right. and a lot of them from government services as I well. See. So of course, it was it was initially it took some time to convince them and give them confidence. But I think uh, once you have gone for it, I think uh, family just comes up and say, okay, right. you know. And and for us, I think one thing that I always try to explain my parents is that uh, at any point of time if you can convert your passion into profession I think that can't be that better really right so I think that that's something exactly. that clicked for all of us. That's also very fortunate I'm yeah. sure that uh, they're giving you a thumbs up for the way it's all turning out but uh, getting back to the products we understood what the sorter does what about the butler? So the butler system is essentially, uh, if you look at normal warehouses, mm. right? Uh, people actually walk inside warehouses and find your items, the things that you've ordered online, mm. in shelves and try to pick them off. Mm. Uh, we essentially tried to pivot or change that model all along because we thought all the walking that people are doing mm. is a very inefficient process. So what we said was, why don't the racks come Some to you? Some 13 kilometers, like you told 13 me, kilometers average, is yeah. what an average a person walks mm. in a warehouse. A so day. We, a day. A day. A wow. shift, actually, not wow. even a day. Okay. Okay. So he does in that eight hours. So that's really something. Firstly, he doesn't like his job, mm. right? And that's apart true. from that, right. he's actually being very inefficient. Yeah. So we said, why don't we flip around the problem, mm. which is we make the person stand still mm -hmm. and that the racks come mm. with the right items so that he just has to keep picking items and that's mm. all he's doing. Mm. And so that's what the butler system mm. does mm. and moves these racks around. Mm. It actually, in terms of efficiency, a person can actually do somewhere close to uh, 10 to 15 items an hour, mm. which he can go and lift in sure. a warehouse. With a butler system, he can actually do close to 600 an hour. So that's wow. kind of uh, how efficient it makes. I'm trying desperately to calculate how many times that is. Yes, but, right. uh, um, but yeah, that, that, that really is, is, is wow. And you know, I, I, I just want to take uh, sort of a look at uh, your, we just take you back to your time at campus. And you know, like it is a college startup. You were in your uh, third year, you were still there. And you know, this was, talk was happening. You were also privileged to be, say, on a top campus. You were at Bates. I'm sure there was a lot of excitement and all of that happening around you. But And, and a lot of people with a lot of ideas. So how did you two sort of zero in on, on each other? We've actually been working for about three and a half years before this startup. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that we were actually involved in a humanoid project, mm. which we built, which was called Akhyut. It mm. was a humanoid robot. So a humanoid robot has two hands, two legs, mm. plays kung fu and soccer. And that's what we were building before this. So as a result, uh, I think... This is not the one that was waiting tables at the college cafeteria. No, that's that was another, another robot that uh, we I made. I see. Okay. So we've... We've been doing stuff together for I see. a lot yeah, of I think times. I started working with Samay like the first month I joined college. So oh, it was, I see. Okay. Yeah, it was like August 2008 when we started working together so. on this humanoid project. Okay. You know, you, you were just 25 and 28. Yeah. Lots of people would perhaps look at you and say, this is why India's startup space is buzzing. They're young, they are entrepreneurial, they have the ability to take risks. Money, of course, everyone wants to do well commercially, but for them, that's not be all and mm -hmm. end all. You just, you know, mentioned that this is what I tell startups, you know, to sort of, and, and so on. For all those who, who, who are watching and sort of want to know what are the lessons you've learned, the two lessons that you've learned, and two reasons why you believe you've been successful. It's very <coughs> important to have a good core team to start with. Hmm. Uh, that's the team who's going to be with you in your ups and downs. So it's very, very important that uh, in your initial year, six months, build a good core team of four to five people. Is it tough to narrow in on those, to zero uh, in on those four to five? Of course, because at that point of time, um, because you're not really known or anything right, like that, right. it's tough to convince uh, people who are already doing some job or kind of thing. But, uh, you know, as tough it is, but it is equally important. Fundamentally, the most important thing, and it's mm. where a lot of startups get it wrong, I feel. Mm that uh, you know the co-founders firstly is finding his stuff but you mm. get your co-founder so that's that's co-founders are like 
fundamentally sure. the most important thing. Sure. But right after that, what Akash is saying is actually correct. I don't know whether we planned it or not, but we turned out to be quite lucky on, you know, the first uh, five, six people that we mm. had. Mm. Uh, they are essentially the core part of the company today also. Mm. Mm. And they are not, you know, people who are just there because we could afford them at that stage. Right. And, and that would you, you would say is one reason for success or do you want to add more? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think second very important thing, uh, uh, which is, uh, is, is, you know, getting the right culture initially and making sure, you know, these five or six people or core team that you have spreads that culture uh, with you. And she especially as the space picks up, as hardware sort of picks up and gets more and more competitive and you find more players, it's going to get tougher and tougher, I, I, I imagine, right? You have a significant head start, so let's That's let's true. Say, With yeah. a 95% market share, you don't need to worry. Is part of the work culture everyone has to wear grey and orange? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they <laughs> prefer so, but... It is? <laughs> <laughs> and there are brownie right. points for it? <laughs> <laughs> we could do something about that. Yes, you could. You could. You could always do that. Uh, I want to just look at the, the hardware space a bit mm -hmm. closely. Uh, from everything that we read on, online, there are lots of people who say, look, Hardware isn't cool. It isn't, you know, it doesn't make it to front pages. The customer doesn't usually know what's happening about the sort of the bottle and other hardware e excitement that might be happening. As a result of which, very often I've heard people say that funding gets tough. Is you know, the space isn't something that people are looking at. How has it worked for you? Is that been your experience, or do you believe that look, you have a great idea? There's always going to be money. How? What would you say, Samir? I. I won't say that the funding is tough. Of mm. course, we might be spoiled and we might have been mm. had the nice journey. Mm. But I think let's get fundamentals right. Hardware is tough, mm. right? So and it is as tougher. a space, it is as tough. a space, it's tough. Explain why. Uh, I think building hardware products which have electronics, mechanical I software. I see. It's the just nuts a, and bolts work is tough. It's it's an engineering problem. It's a right. tougher engineering problem. You don't control everything right. in your environment, so it's physically tough. Right? Is that so, more tough being in India? Is it? Tougher doing this in India, you think if you were say yes. in, in the West, uh, Japan or the US, it would be? For different? sure. So yeah. it is tougher in India. What makes it tougher here? Uh, I think the ecosystem. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's one thing around job shops. Mm -hmm. So if you want prototypes, you can get them quite easily right. in the US. Right. Uh, when you look at parts, you can do. So mm -hmm. India has a lot of e commerce, mm -hmm. right? But this mm -hmm. is e commerce still consumer facing. Right. We don't have right. e commerce towards electronic sure. goods, parts, sure. and that. And of course, like just to give an example, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When you do a hardware product, you got to have like a mechanical engineer, or electronics engineer, a mm -hmm. firmware engineer, and a mm -hmm. server engineer, right? Mm -hmm. Initially, there might be two people doing the whole thing, right? Sure. But uh, you got to work on all the four fields mm -hmm. if you want to get out of a pro get out of the product, right? So mm -hmm. it's not about just sitting down and coding on your laptops, right? So it's about going to a vendor, buying something, getting it you know, manufactured in some way, prototyping it, coming back, mm. assembling, making PCBs. So it, it's a whole whole wider space to right. kind of... So uh, actually being uh, hands-on. Yeah, it's This is an important point you make, that it's not just yeah. sitting on your laptop coding. I would say it's also important to not build cheap. I mm. think we do that mistake a lot in India in hardware. Which is, is that part of our sort of Jugaad mindset that, yeah, chalo, Jugaad karlo, it'll work, yeah. something will happen? So see, I think Jugaad has a place in product development. It hmm. de definitely, that is one of our strengths. Hmm. But it also ha does not have a place in product hmm. development. Then how do you stay competitive? I think uh, price and, uh, you know, qual compromising on the hmm. quality is a hmm. function of scale. So as soon as you scale up, you mm. can actually get the prices down, mm. right? And you will go to scale and you'll do all of that. Mm. But imagine if in your R&D you used cheaper components or mm. stuff like that, mm. because of which you didn't even make something which was working, mm. you lose the battle much more before mm. you get to a product. <laughs>